up today, the United States and China agree to fully implement international sanctions on North Korea for its nuclear and missile provocations. South Korea's National Assembly holds its first special session, but the rival parties still can't agree on who should take the prized Assembly Speaker post. First, the price of US crude tops $50 a barrel for the first time in 11 months as disruptions to supply continue to elevate oil. Stay tuned for these stories and more. Hello and welcome. It's 6 a.m. on Wednesday, June 8th here in Seoul. I'm Mark Broom and you're tuned into our early morning edition of Arirang News. Our top story this morning, the United States and China have agreed to continue fully implementing sanctions on North Korea. The agreement came during annual strategic and economic high-level talks between the two superpowers, which wrapped up on Tuesday. However, Washington and Beijing couldn't see eye to eye on the disputes in the South China Sea. Guan Zhang reports. The U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry declared that the U.S. and China are on the same page regarding North Korea. Speaking after the conclusion of the annual U.S.-China Strategic and Economic Dialogue on Tuesday, Kerry said the U.S. and China were determined to fully enforce U.N. sanctions on the regime and that neither nations were willing to accept North Korea as a nuclear weapon state. This comes in a somewhat conflicting tone from last week when a top North Korean diplomat made a surprise visit to Beijing. Yi Su-yong, the regime's vice party chair, met with Chinese President Xi Jinping with the two expressed intentions to mend ties. Yi is also thought to have said the regime plans to continue developing its nuclear weapons. Aside from North Korea, another key topic of this year's US-China talks was China's reclamation of islands in the South China Sea. Unsurprisingly, a substantial agreement on this issue was not reached, and while Kerry called for talks and a peaceful resolution, State Councillor Yang Jiechi warned the U.S. from getting too involved, saying China hopes that the U.S. will abide by its promise to not take sides in the disputes and play a constructive role in safeguarding peace and stability in the South China Sea. This dispute, along with other trade issues that were discussed at the talks, are expected to carry on until September, when the next G20 summit convenes in Hangzhou, China. Kwon jang Arirang News. Now, South Korea is courting North Korea's long-time allies for their support in pushing the regime to abandon its nuclear program. Feeling the pressure, Pyongyang is also attempting to work its charm to hold on to the few friendly ties it still has. Connie Kim with more. South Korea views a foreign minister's meeting between Seoul and Havana as significant, as the two countries have not had any diplomatic relations since the Cuban Revolution in 1959. Seoul's foreign minister Yoon Byung-se sat down with his counterpart Bruno Rodriguez on Monday on the sidelines of the summit of the Association of Caribbean States, laying a foundation for mending their severed bilateral relations. The hosting of the South Korea-Cuba foreign minister's meeting itself was meaningful and has become an opportunity to improve bilateral relations. The discussions are believed to have expanded cooperation and strengthened diplomacy in Latin America and the Caribbean. Seoul's efforts to strengthen its ties with Havana are part of South Korea's plans to further isolate North Korea in the international community. Uganda's promise to suspend all military cooperation with its longtime ally Pyongyang after a visit to the country by the South Korean president is billed as a crucial achievement in cornering the North. Seoul has also confirmed Poland did not accept a single North Korean worker since the North conducted its fourth nuclear test early this year. Up to 60,000 North Koreans are reportedly working abroad, funneling 120 to 230 million U.S. dollars into the regime annually. North Korea, for its part, seems to be doing its best to maintain ties with communist states. High-level North Korean officials have recently flown to Equatorial Guinea, Cuba and China to meet with presidents and high-ranking officials. North Korea's Korean Central News Agency reported Tuesday, the vice chairman of the ruling Workers' Party Central Committee Che Tae-bok arrived in Laos after a meeting with a senior official in Vietnam. 
South Korea's foreign minister will meet with his Russian counterpart in Moscow next week as part of ongoing efforts to pressure North Korea. The two will discuss the regime's nuclear weapons program as well as ways to boost bilateral ties between Seoul and Moscow. Connie Kim, Arirang News. The Korean Navy and Coast Guard are conducting a military drill to defend Korea's easternmost island of Dokdo. Participating in the exercise are around 10 warships, as well as Lynx anti submarine helicopters and P 3C maritime surveillance aircraft. The drills may send a strong message to Japan, which continues to make claims to the islets, with the latest efforts coming through its high school textbooks and diplomatic blue book. Korean officials say Tokyo's claims are false and the exercise has nothing to do with diplomacy. The Dokdo defense drill has been carried out twice a year since 1986. The Navy and Coast Guard will train to block forces from approaching the island and send them away from the sea. Korea's National Assembly missed the legal deadline on Tuesday for choosing who will take the coveted Assembly Speaker post. The ruling and opposition parties remain deadlocked over which side should fill that and other key parliamentary positions. Jim Young Gil with the details. The first extraordinary session of the 20th National Assembly kicked off on Tuesday. The lawmakers from the rival political parties are still wrangling over which of them will take the position of Speaker. The opposition bloc may now be bigger than the ruling party, which has put pressure on us to vote, but thinking they can win the speaker's seat infringes on parliamentarianism. This Henry party lost its parliamentary majority in the April general election, garnering 122 seats, while the main opposition Minju Party of Korea won 123. Minor parties and independents took the remaining 55. The Senori party says tradition dictates that the ruling party take the speaker's seat. The Minju party says it should go to the party with the most seats. All parliaments around the world give the speaker's seat to the biggest party. Since the Senori party is now the second largest party, it's in a state of shock as it's been accustomed to being the number one player. The minor opposition People's Party urged the two rivals to at least put a candidate forward and have the assembly vote. The Minju Party accepted, but the Senuri Party, now without a parliamentary majority, rejected the idea. The rival party should first put up a candidate for the speaker post. Once we elect the speaker, it will be easy to select the two deputy speakers. Then we should carry on with selecting the heads of the standing committees. The three parties have until Thursday to select the standing committee heads. Jim young Arirang News. Now, prosecutors have summoned the former head of Oxy Korea for additional questioning about his involvement in the toxic humidifier disinfectant scandal. Lee Min Young tells us more. The former head of Oxy Record Bank Kizer Korea was called in for a second round of questioning on the company's toxic humidifier sterilizer, which killed or seriously injured hundreds of people in Korea. John Lee, who is currently the CEO of Google Korea, appeared at the Seoul Central District Prosecutor's Office on Tuesday. Prosecutors are deciding whether to file for a warrant for Lee's arrest. Lee was first summoned two weeks ago when prosecutors tried to ascertain if he was aware of the toxicity of PHMG, a toxic compound used in the sterilizer. Lee was accused of failing to act after receiving complaints from customers about the side effects of the product. He is also being accused of false advertisement as OxyKorea reassured customers the product was safe for children, even though that was unconfirmed. Lee was the chief executive of Oxy Korea from 2005 to 2010, when sales of the sterilizers were at their highest. He has denied all the allegations. While the prosecution questions the CEO, civic groups are trying to hold the government to account. The non-profit lawyers group Minbyon on Monday accused the Environment Ministry of being aware of the potential dangers of the toxic ingredient while turning a blind eye to the fact that customers were exposed to the deadly chemical PHMG. Minbyon cited an environment ministry report from 2005 that noted the potential dangers of PHMG in Oxy products and said they were negligent because it did not conduct any follow-up testing. 
the humidifier disinfectant case has been rated as one of the worst scandals involving common household products with chemical ingredients. It came to light after four pregnant women died of lung problems from unknown causes in 2011. Lee Min Young, Arirang News. The Korean government has filed a criminal complaint against Nissan Korea CEO based on accusations the Japanese car maker cheated on auto emissions tests. Kim Hye Sung reports. Korea's Environment Ministry has filed a criminal complaint against Nissan Korea for allegedly manipulating vehicle emissions tests. The ministry also ordered a recall of 814 Qashqai SUVs sold from November 15 to May this year and suspended future sales of the model. It also fined the Japanese car maker 286,000 U.S. dollars. The Environment Ministry has made quite a strong move by filing a criminal complaint against Nissan Korea. This means Korean prosecutors will launch a full investigation into the matter, and we will see the results come out fairly soon. The SUV's emissions management system allegedly turns off automatically under regular driving conditions at temperatures over 35 degrees Celsius. By turning off the device, fresh air cannot enter the engine compartment, producing more nitrogen oxide emissions. Nissan Korea has denied any wrongdoing, saying the system turns off automatically in order to prevent engine damage from overheating. It added that EU authorities did not find anything wrong after putting the vehicle through similar testing standards as Korean regulators. The Korean government conducted emissions tests on 20 different diesel car models, including Nissan's Qashqai, after Volkswagen admitted last year to using a cheat device to falsify its emissions data. Kim hye Arirang News. Now, experts have identified diesel cars as being partly responsible for the increasingly bad air quality in the nation. More eco-friendly vehicles on the streets could help counter that problem, of course. For more on the Korean government's measures to encourage more people to buy green cars, Ian Shin reports. An auto industry report last year shows cars with diesel engines are more popular among Koreans than cars with gasoline engines. Better fuel economy and stronger horsepower drive their popularity. But studies show in addition to fine dust, diesel engines boost the level of ozone, especially during the summer. Under the season's intense heat and sunlight, the nitrogen oxide in the car emissions breaks down into atoms through a photochemical reaction. The oxygen atom then combines with the molecular oxygen in the air, creating ozone. An ozone at the ground level, experts say, presents intractable air quality and health problems along with fine dust. Breathing ground level ozone can be extremely damaging to one's skin, eyes and respiratory system. According to the 2006 guidelines of the World Health Organization, when the ozone level is above 90 ppb at ground level, it even increases the mortality rate by 1 to 2 percent. The Korean government tried to resolve these problems by proposing new measures, such as enforcing more strict emissions tests on diesel cars. But even with filters that meet the new emissions standards, the detrimental effects to the atmosphere caused by these vehicles is inevitable. Which is why Korea is trying to expand eco-friendly transportation such as CNS buses and supplies for electric and hydrogen cars to tackle the fundamental problem. To promote the sale of eco-friendly cars, the government announced new plans, including offering discounts on parking and toll gate fees, as well as adding 20 more hydrogen filling stations throughout the country by 2020. When it comes to hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, the most well-known benefit is that it's pollutant-free. The only thing that these cars produce is water, and the water is clean enough to drink. With the administration's support and a greater environmentally conscious mindset among Koreans, eco-friendly vehicles may one day crowd roads in Korea. Ian Shin, Arirang News. Now, in the United States, Democratic Party presidential hopeful Hillary Clinton has reportedly secured enough delegate support to be the nominee. And at this moment, the final six states are casting their votes in the primary race. The states voting Tuesday are California with the highest number of delegates at 548, followed by New Jersey with 142 delegates. Americans in New Mexico, Montana, 
South Dakota and North Dakota are also casting their votes as well. Although Clinton has secured the required number of delegates to take on Donald Trump in November, the final primary results could still have an impact on her standing. A possible defeat to her Democratic rival Bernie Sanders in some major states like California might lead to a shift in support by the superdelegates in next month's national convention, possibly, potentially leading to an upset in the nomination. Now, for the first time in 11 months, the U.S. benchmark crude oil has topped $50 a barrel. On the New York Mercantile Exchange Tuesday, West Texas Intermediate for July delivery finished trading at 50.36 a barrel, up 67 cents or 1.4 percent from the previous day. The last time it topped $50 was on July 21st last year. On London's ICE futures. Brent crude for July delivery traded at 51.42, up 87 cents from the previous day. Now, the gains come ahead of a stockpile report by the U.S. Energy Information Administration that is expected to show that inventories of U.S. crude declined for three weeks in a row and oil supply was disrupted in Nigeria. Well, those are stories we're following on this Wednesday morning here in Seoul. For more of the latest, don't forget to check out the website, alidang.com forward slash news. And we also have a smartphone application where you can find all the latest news and our programs as well. Just search for Adirang TV in your app store. Have a great day. Goodbye.